Okay, all righty. I'm Sarah Alvarez. I'm the editor at Outwire Media, and I'm sitting here with Aaron Glantz, a reporter and author, and we're talking about his new book, Homewreckers. So, Aaron, your book is about kind of the lack of recovery after the Great Recession. And I think that that's something that people here in Detroit are very familiar with. There's a story about how there is a recovery going on, but a lot of people here don't feel it. So what does your reporting tell you about why people are not feeling the recovery when it comes to housing? Well, basically the question that I wanted to ask was, eight million Americans lost their homes in the Great Recession, and all of those homes didn't just disappear, right? Somebody bought them, something happened to them, and very few places were more hard hit than Detroit. And so I wanted to learn who benefited from this system, and that's what led me to the home wreck. Tell me about that term. What, when did you come up with it? Why do you use it? What is that? What is a homewrecker? The homewreckers are the people who saw this cataclysm happening in our economy and just kind of licked their lips at an opportunity to profit from it. And so they did this in a variety of ways. Uh, Steve Mnuchin, uh, who's now the Treasury Secretary, he bought this failed California bank called IndyMac. Uh, he bought it off the government for nothing. Uh, and then he proceeded to get a billion dollars in government subsidies as he foreclosed on 100,000 families, including 23,000 seniors. And Michigan was the number three state for his foreclosure machine. Uh, and so he profited by foreclosing. Then there are other businessmen like Tom Barrick, who's Donald Trump's closest friend, or Steve Schwartzman, the head of the Blackstone Group, that saw all of these foreclosures and they used government incentives and subsidies to buy them up and hold them off the market and charge increasing rents so that families like yours and mine couldn't buy them. Right. And in Detroit, we have seen Detroit go from a majority owner-occupied city to a majority renter city. And what is the dynamic of all of these homes lost in the Great Recession and this transition to rental housing? Well, I mean, we need to ask ourselves, why is it that even though the unemployment rate in America is low and the stock market is doing great, that people feel so screwed, right? And the reason is that we don't own anything anymore, right? If we are making a decent salary, but we are paying more and more and more in rent, then we are feeling the squeeze. And yes, we have a roof over our head, because our landlord is providing it, but we have no way to build equity and security for our family and pass it on to the next generation. So in America, the average homeowner is worth about $200,000, and the average renter is worth about $2,000, because we have no ability to save. Right? We spend most of our money on things like food, and housing, and transportation, and health care, and clothing, and all of those other things just disappear as soon as we spend it. We literally like burn up our gas money, right? We eat our food, but we can take that housing dollars, like a third or maybe even half of the amount of money we take home, and put it into the ground. And, uh, and that is, that's the American way, right? And now that's being taken away from us. Right. And we've known each other for a while, and I remember when you were reporting on the Veterans Administration that you told me sometimes a system is a character in the story. There are so many systems when it comes to housing, right? There, housing is the intersection of all these different systems. So in your reporting, what do you feel like is the system that was, is most important for regular individuals when it comes to housing? What system either not working is the most impactful? I, I think that the thing that we don't focus enough on is the system of credit and the way that the banks provide financing. You know, when I'm talking about these people like Steve Schwartzman or Tom Barrick, these billionaires who are buying up tens of thousands of houses, you know, we might think that they're buying them with cash because when they go out to the courthouse, they're paying with cash, but they're borrowing money too. They're just borrowing in a different way. They're borrowing money not like $100,000 at a time, but a billion dollars at a time. And the banks that they're going to for credit are the same banks that you and I would go to for credit. So you have a bank like JP Morgan Chase, the biggest bank in America that extends 
uh, loans to companies like Blackstone to buy homes or refinance their rental homes a billion dollars at a time. And then you look at their consumer lending, they're lending to families down, 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 down since the Great Recession. Not just down during the housing bust itself, but lower in 2016 than it was in 2010, right? And so if we ask, why is the recovery so uneven? It's because we are not being financed. And this system uh, is especially hard for working people of color, right? In cities like Detroit, we have uh, redlining, just like we did back in the 1930s, where the city of Detroit, people cannot get loans. And even when people of color make the same amount of money as their white counterparts and try to buy homes in the same neighborhood, uh, we at Reveal found that here in Detroit, they're more than twice as likely to be denied a home loan. And, and so there is a system of finance. It requires us to look at it. Right? We are often told that issues like gentrification are caused by the influx of affluent white people into a neighborhood and that they might be pushing out some of the longtime residents. And, and that might be part of it, right? But who's financing those folks and who's not financing the longtime residents? That is also part of the picture. Right. And this question of financing, I think, gets us to another point that I feel like is really important in that a house has never been just a house. You know, it was an American dream for a long time, right? Everybody has like emotion wrapped up in their house, but now a house is also a business, right? And if every house is a business, what's the impact on transparency and on accountability if you have individual houses owned by an LLC with, you know, say the address is like 123 Avenue. It's, it's a really big problem that we have here in America. It's especially a big issue in cities like Detroit that have had so many foreclosures and thus such a growth of shell companies. In America today, there are 3 million homes and more than 10 million apartment units that are owned by shell companies where you can't find out who the landlord is. They dump trash out on the street and the city wants to deal with it. Who did it? You know, a post office box in Delaware did it, right? You know, um, who's the eventual owner? We don't know, right? And, and this is a huge problem. Now, in my book, I trace some of these corporate owners uh, to good friends of Donald Trump. People like Tom Barrick, Steve Schwartzman, you know, known quantities. And so now, as a result of my journalism, you know, community advocates can go and try to hold these people accountable. And actually, after my first story on Tom Barrick's company, he quit, he quit the company and he sold it off. Right, and so he's out of the business now. But but we put it, we're able to put a face to the real estate empire. But each one of these corporate landlords is its own investigative journalism project, right? And so there's no way for just a regular person to go to the library, you know, or the county courthouse or the phone book and find out like who owns the house that I live in. You know, if the window breaks and the um, the the company that is supposed to maintain the building doesn't fix it, like, who do I call then? Right. You know, a lawyer in Delaware? Right. You know? And we found, I mean, in the work that we do, um, we find that that's people's most common question. That's what they want to use our service for the most, is just to find out who owns the place that they're living. Yeah, and th there is some reporting on this. It goes to the Treasury police, and it's designed to stop international money laundering. But the Treasury police keep it secret. Uh, they collect this information under something called the Bank Secrecy Act. So I've asked them for this information, and they gave one of these uh, uh, answers that you expect to hear from like the CIA, like, we can neither confirm nor deny that these records exist. And I'm like, look, I'm just trying to find out who owns the house on Cherry Street, right? <laughs> this is not a national security issue. And they're like, sorry, we can neither neither confirm nor deny that we have this information. I mean, that is what's happened in our country. Um, so there's a bill in Congress uh, to increase transparency, but it would still not make the information public. It would just make more information available to the Treasury police. So, um, you know, I've become increasingly interested. Are there ways that state and local governments can increase the amount of transparency so that local officials and tenants and neighbors can find out who is buying up our cities? Right. And then hold those people accountable if something's not going right or if somebody's not doing their job.
Yeah, or even just say hello to them. That's like true. Like maybe if we knew who they were, they might fund a community center, mm -hmm. right? But right now, if it's like, I mean, eventually owned by a, by, a, by a foreign sheikh or a Chinese investor or a Wall Street firm, and it's just a line on a ledger for them, they don't even realize maybe that they own a house in Detroit, right? right? They just know that they have a securitized bundle of assets, right? So even if we can just kind of like bring alive even to these investors, that they're part of a community, they may not feel that way now, but maybe they would if there were people in that community calling them up, talking to them. That's true, that's true, that's a good point. I think that is a dynamic that we've seen here in Detroit. It's incredibly strong, this dynamic of bulk buyers, people who buy up many, many, many houses, um, either, in a local market like Detroit or across the country. And that's something that you looked at too in your book, Home Wreckers. What's the implication for a local community like Detroit of the market transitioning from a time when it was like one person buying a home from another person and now we have a bulk buyer, a group of investors buying up hundreds of properties at maybe one time? Well, I mean, first of all, it has a devastating effect on the individual families, right? Because they don't have an opportunity to own a stake in the American dream. They don't have, like for me, I bought a house in 2009 during the housing crisis, and now I live in a city where real estate values have gone up. San you Francis live in San Francisco. I live in San Francisco, and so I feel secure. That's the first thing, right? Like some of my neighbors who are tenants are worried that they'll be forced out by rising rents. I'm sitting there in my house with my 30-year fixed mortgage, right? I'm gonna pay the same amount each and every month to live in my house, and unless something terrible happens to me, I'm gonna be okay. Right, and so my kids know that they're gonna be okay, right? And they can grow up with this basic level of security. And then as I age and I pay off the house gradually over time, heaven forfend when I get old and wanna stop working, I may even be able to retire, right? And, and if you are a tenant, you are robbed of all of the things that I have just explained, right? So um, if you, if you want to rent, I mean, sometimes people are moving around, they want to rent for a while, but if you get to the point where you want to buy and you are robbed of that opportunity, then you are robbed of stability, right? And you are robbed of so many economic options. Like you want to take a little bit of money out of your house because you've been paying it off and send your kid to college, forget it, right? You're paying all that money in rent. And so I, I just kind of want to take this housing issue that is so critical in all of our communities and put it into the debate about wealth and security in this country and also move the focus away from like, uh, you know, we have too much housing, we have not enough housing, like we have not enough development, we have too much development. Let's get into the discussion of wealth, security, equity, and financing, right? Who's providing the money, who wins, and who loses based on those decisions. One thing I wanted to talk to you about specifically that is in your book, it's mentioned in your book, and it is a, an important dynamic here in Detroit that I don't think gets enough attention, uh, is this issue of reverse mortgages. Yes. So in your book, you profile a couple of people who were not renters, they were homeowners, and then as they got old, and, um, and honestly, these people had dementia and were not necessarily knowing what they were signing, got into these reverse mortgage agreements, and ended up, their heirs ended up losing these homes. Detroit had the most, had the highest rate of reverse mortgage foreclosures between 2013 and 2017 of any place in the country. And it's not something that I think people really talk about much here. Tell me what a reverse mortgage is and how it can be damaging for the long-term stability of a family. Yeah, so a reverse mortgage is basically the opposite of a regular mortgage. <laughs> it's so, a reverse. <laughs> yeah, so I, I bought my house 10 years ago. I got a mortgage. Every month I make a payment to the bank 
Part of it is interest and part of it is principal. And over time, I pay down my debt and at the end of the mortgage, I will own my house free and clear. That's a regular mortgage. A reverse mortgage is the opposite of that. The bank gives you some cash and then month after month, they add more interest and fees and the interest compounds because the debt is getting bigger. And then when you die, the bank usually takes the house. And the salesmen who sell these loans, they don't tell you that the bank is gonna take the house. So for example, one of the families I write about in the book, uh, the Hickerson family, which bought their house in Thousand Oaks, California, right outside of LA. They paid less than $90,000 back in the 80s to buy this house that's now worth half a million dollars. In 2005, when Richard the father was sick with cancer and his wife had Alzheimer's and, and had dementia, a salesman arrives at their door and he gives a presentation for one of these reverse mortgages. And the last slide reads, so you ask, what's the catch? None, there is no catch. So this is what these elderly, you know, families, homeowners are being told, like we're gonna give you money and there literally is no catch. The catch is that when you die, the bank can take the house. Right, and so these mortgages, I'm not surprised to learn that Detroit is the number one city for reverse mortgage foreclosures because these reverse mortgages particularly target the African American community. Uh, the African American community in this country uh, had the opportunity during the civil rights movement to be building equity and health and holds a disproportionate share of their assets in their homes as opposed to say the stock market right, or 401k plan or, or pensions. Like more likely African-American families to the extent they have savings to have it in their home. And so what we have now is we have mortgage companies, so-called mortgage companies, coming to these families who built up this wealth over generations and dispossessing them of it. The, the term of art that sometimes gets used is asset stripping. Right, mm -hmm. but that's a term of art. It is really, reducing a family's wealth and ability to achieve economic mobility over the long term. It's, it's like, yeah, you get some money right now. You never have to pay it back. But the catch is the bank takes the house. Right. So we both cover housing. We deal with these issues every day and we see them kind of at scale. Right, and I think we get used to this story of a deck stacked against regular people, regular homeowners or regular renters. But even for us, I think that this story can, these types of stories can be depressing, right? They can really feel like, what, where is this going? How are regular people going to be able to um, get a leg up? And you, while not, of course, having an answer for that, did profile some people in your book who, and some community organizations, some really well-organized community organizations, that had some wins. What do you feel like, for those people and those community organizations, what do you feel like they did that was effective in, in advocating for themselves or for their community? Yeah, oddly, like despite all the doom and gloom that we've been talking about this whole time, I come away from this whole experience feeling very optimistic. Interesting. Yeah, because first of all, as you mentioned, there were a lot of people fighting back and they did not just get rolled over, you know? So the woman who was the daughter of the, of the Hickersons who lost their house to this predatory reverse mortgage. And who didn't know about it. Who didn't know about it until after it was signed. When she found out about it, she started to fight back. She fought back for 10 years. She fought in court, she, she lost the house. She ended up paying more than $40,000 in rent to this a shell company uh, controlled by the president's best friend. She kept fighting back, she kept fighting back, she kept fighting back. And then in 2017, after Steve Mnuchin, the guy who foreclosed on her family, had become the treasury secretary, she continued to persist and won an $89 million whistleblower settlement for the taxpayers because he was uh, accused of breaking the law and bilking the taxpayers. And that $89 million settlement for the government included a $1.6 million bounty for her. Um, there were also community organizations who used laws like the Community Reinvestment Act that mandates 
that banks uh, make loans in uh, low and moderate income neighborhoods. They use it as a cudgel of pressure when sometimes these banks wanted to merge and flip their assets. And we're able to, to make some gains. Uh, but the main reason I'm optimistic now is I feel that the winds in this country are changing a little bit. I feel like these issues of housing and equity are moving to the front burner again. Uh, I watched the Democratic presidential campaign last night, and when one of the moderators finally asked a question about housing, I saw the candidates like fighting for the microphone. So Elizabeth Warren talked about her plan to reverse the practice of redlining in this country. Um, you know, Cory Booker talked about his experience as mayor of Newark, New Jersey, and his desire to invest more in public housing and wealth building, right? Uh, most of the candidates running for president on the Democratic side, uh, with the notable exception of Joe Biden, have offered quite ambitious housing plans. And I think if people like Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders and Pete Buttigieg and Cory Booker, Kamala Harris are, are, are encouraged to engage on these issues, then we will have a really robust discussion in this country because they have good ideas, right? And, uh, and then as for the guy who's currently in the White House, you know, we started off this conversation talking about the homewreckers in his, his, in his inner circle who profited off of it. So I think that it's like likely that uh, in the election next year we'll have a pretty clear choice on these topics. And that's good because it means that it's something that we're thinking about, debating, and I think that we may, you know, we may have the opportunity to be moving towards some pretty productive solutions. You live in California and you're a reporter that focuses on issues all around the country. What do you think that people here in Detroit should be paying attention to when it comes to housing? What are the trends that you feel like are important for folks to keep their eyes on um, if they want to make sure to keep transparency and accountability? You have some really unique challenges here in Detroit. You have more uh, of these shell company buyers of property than almost anywhere in the country. You also have some of the least bank lending of anywhere in the country. So you have some of the biggest barriers to the American dream anywhere in the country. And I would focus on both of those two parts of the equation, right? The shell company owners, who are they? Can we increase transparency in that area so that we, the public, know more about who's buying up the city? And then the banks. Real estate here is cheap compared to like where I live, California. People can't buy houses because they don't make enough money and they don't take enough home every month. In Detroit, even if you have a good job, the bank still won't give you a loan to buy a house. And so we need to address this broken system of finance that is keeping people out. And it does have a racial component, right? It is linked to historic and current practices of discrimination and lending. And so, you know, to the extent that banks are breaking fair lending laws and uh, equal protection laws in the in the lending space, in the home ownership space, uh, to lock people out of home ownership in Detroit, so that then the shell company owners can buy the houses. You know, I think that you know we don't have to depend on the president for this, right? We have a state attorney general, we have local elected officials, we have uh, nonprofit groups that could potentially bring lawsuits uh, if if they're warranted, and. Um, you know, also uh, about Detroit, you have the biggest mortgage lender in the entire country based in Detroit, Quicken Loans. And, uh, you know, I know that there is a lot of positive PR coming out of that company, but I think uh, looking at its actual lending numbers in the city that it's based and asking if it's adequately investing in its own hometown, not in terms of like buying real estate and redevelopment, but families and their ability to gain wealth, you know, the kind of mortgages that it'll give to somebody who wants to buy a house in the suburbs in California, is it willing to make that same kind of loan to a family in Detroit? These are all great questions. This has been great. This has been great to talk to you. Aaron Glantz, the uh, author of Home Records and a reporter for Reveal. And I'm Sarah Alvarez, and I'm the editor at Outlier Media.